I'm going to call the uh, May March 16th uh, CCS acquisitions uh, meeting to order. Welcome. Um, for our first uh, point of business, for our first point of business, um, do we have any changes, um, additions to the um, minutes from the last meeting of September? Anyone? No changes. Okay. Um, can I get a motion to approve um, the minutes from the September meeting? Mary, G, move and a second, please. I can I can okay. second. I can it. second it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, at this time, do we have any additions uh, to the current agenda? All right. Let's see, no, nobody in the chat. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the next um, point of business, which is the uh, um, nomination and election um, for the officers for 22-23. Um, we need a vice chair and a secretary. Um, is anybody uh, willing to step forward and do this? Anybody? Let's see. Hmm. So if you know it, it's two meetings um, per year now. Um, it's not that difficult. Um, and if we don't have anybody today, we can have a special meeting um, or election during the summer um, to give people more time to think about it. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. All right, Rachel, what do you think? Uh, would you like to review the job duties? Sure. Up, up. Hang on one second. Good morning. Hello. So um, the responsibilities for um, the, the chair elect and the um, secretary that we're looking at, uh, the chair partners with the CCS staff, um, which is Rachel, to develop um, the agendas you send out the call for um, agenda items that are uh, relevant to our meeting two weeks prior to the meeting um, and assigns appropriate individuals to present agenda items. Uh, the chair distributes the meeting agenda, ensures distribution of the meeting minutes and facilitates, it says quarterly meetings here, but we're doing um, twice a year. And then the chair elect just um, um, acts in the chair's absence. So we'll do those things. Generally, we'll not have to do all of the other things, but just chairs the meeting if the um, chair can't be there. Uh, the secretary um, takes the role at the meetings and it's just the sign in sheet and Rachel just usually sends that on to us and does the mini uh, meeting minutes and then delivers the meet the minutes, the draft of them to the CCS uh, staff and the chair. Um, and you'll get a training from Rachel and that that's about it for the duties. It's pretty straightforward. It's not too terribly difficult. And it's it's rewarding to give back to your consortium. Okay, that's my pitch. And if we don't have anybody today, then uh, Rachel and I will talk about, um, and Sandy about having 
a, a summer meeting and we'll reach out to you again. So please consider it and um, thank you. And anytime during the meeting, you can jump in if you're still thinking about it and let us know and we can circle back to that. All right, um, next we'll move on to the CCS staff reports and that is Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my full staff report can be found in the packet that I already emailed out. Um, today, I would just like to highlight um, a few items in it. I am focusing on the creation of an acquisitions course for LEAP for the uh, 7.1 upgrade. This will include the setup tasks of creating the fiscal year and fund records and supplier records. And at the moment, there's only an EDI workflow for um, bulk adding the purchase orders or bulk adding the purchase order line items to the purchase order and paying invoices. Uh, there will be two live sessions in April. The setup tasks will be on the 19th at 1 p.m. and EDI workflow will be on the 26th at 1 p.m. The registration links are in the packet. They are in uh, L2. And um, there's also links to new and updated documentation for you to review. Are there any questions? I just wanted to mention again that it's really great to have these packets ahead of time. So you can look at everything and you're prepared. So that was a really great addition. Thank sure. you. Okay, should we move on to the next item? Sure. So we'll move on to item six, business. Um, so the first one, A, is review of canceled uh, publication procedures um, with Rachel. Okay, one moment. I need to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so last month, a number of records were discovered that um, were canceled publications that hadn't been announced to the ACQ listserv and did not have the correct phrase for canceled publication in the 245. Um, I had emailed the listserv our record set with records that have holds and um, item records. A number of libraries still haven't canceled the holds or deleted the item records even after I followed up by emailing the libraries directly. So I um, will send out some information about that again directly to the libraries and the acquisition staff. Um, it really is important to make sure these holds are canceled um, and that the item records are deleted promptly. Um, I'd also like to review the procedures and discuss some suggestions for these procedures. So um, one thing I have changed is that we decided, as I, I mentioned in an email, to change the spelling of canceled because we had both the uh, British and American spelling on the website. So we chose to um, obviously use the American spelling and uh, get out of the habit of two L's. Um, and so I have updated this page for that. Um, and so the first thing uh, in the procedures for canceled publications is to put publication canceled in the 245 field. Um, one thing that has been suggested to me is that uh, the catalogers would like to make sure that the um, display and pack setting is unchecked. Um, is that all right if I add that to the uh, procedures? Yes. Um, so I, one of the issues was that the uh, catalogers had been confused about seeing these records come up. Um, so it would definitely help if the display and pack setting was unchecked. Um, so after doing that, um, if there are any holds for the title, the uh, acquisitions group needs to be emailed 
uh, to announce that the publication has been canceled. All libraries are responsible for deleting their own item records and canceling their holds. Um, I did add a note that um, when an item record is the last item attached to the bibliographic record and you're canceling the purchase order line item or deleting the item, there's a dialog box that will appear asking if you would like to delete the holds. Um, so you can just press no at that time because it's important for each library to um, follow their own procedure for canceling the holds. Um, and uh, one other change that I made to the page um, was suggested by Mieko because she said that frequently it's actually the selectors that cancel the holds and not the circulation staff. So I've just changed that to designated department in case that differs from uh, each library. Um, and one thing I noticed is that some libraries have been withdrawing the on-order records instead of deleting them. You do not have to go through the process of withdrawing an on-order record. You can just press delete um, in these cases. Are there any questions about the procedure or comments? Uh, Rachel, this is Leigh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. uh, question. If there is no holes on the bit record, can we delete it then? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome to delete the bib record if it does get left into the system. Um, Virginia deletes bibliographic records that don't have any items attached on a monthly basis. Are there any other questions? Okay, should we move on to the next item, Rachel? Sure. Okay. So it's the review of the fiscal year rollover process. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. So I know I have uh, done this presentation before and uh, you've probably heard Deborah do the presentation as well. Um, but since this is a yearly occurrence, um, it's easy to forget how fiscal year rollovers work. So um, I'd like to uh, review the fiscal year rollover presentation. Um, and I know there are some new staff that would benefit from hearing from it. Um, so, Basically, this is really the same presentation that you've heard before, but I think it's a good review. Um, so the rollover process transitions the acquisitions module uh, from your current fiscal year to the new fiscal year. It automatically generates a new fiscal year structure identical to that of your current fiscal year. Um, and then it um, sets your status of your fiscal year to either closed or encumbrances closed, depending on the type of rollover that you have. Uh, so there are three options to choose from during your fiscal year. There's the run fiscal year rollover utility that rolls over the free balance, or you can choose to zero out the free balance. Most libraries choose to zero out the free balance. I don't think we have anyone yet that rolls it over. Um, and then you also have an option to replicate the fiscal year hierarchy without um, rolling over any encumbrances. Running the fiscal year rollover utility creates a new fiscal year and fund structure that is identical to that of the previous fiscal year. If the encumbrances are rolled over, the process unlinks certain records connected to the uninvoiced purchase orders from the old funds and relinks those to the corresponding funds in the new fiscal year. So this includes the um, pending purchase orders, uh, purchase order line items connected to the pending purchase orders, open invoices, purchase order templates, etc. Uh, 
Uh, so when you do choose to roll over the encumbrances, the encumbered amounts are disencumbered in the old fiscal year and then rolled over to the new one. So this is recorded in the fund history of the fund records. Um, and then the utility closes all funds from the current or from the previous fiscal year um, so that they will not be available for future orders. Uh, when running the fiscal year utility um, and rolling over the encumbrances, there are two options to choose from. The free balance can either be rolled over with the encumbrances or zeroed out so that all funds start with a zero dollar free balance. Um, and this leaves any unexpended funds in the current fiscal year. So, um, the library staff would then have to allocate money to each of the funds. Um, several libraries do choose to replicate. Um, several libraries do choose to replicate the fiscal year hierarchy. Uh, this creates a new fiscal year uh, with a fund structure identical to that of the current fiscal year, but does not roll over encumbrances or links records. The beginning free balance uh, is $0, and the status of the uh, previous fiscal year is um, updated to encumbrances closed. So in this state, staff can still receive and expend purchase order line items that were encumbered prior to the utility being run so that they can create and pay invoices. So once all outstanding orders have been received and invoiced, you'll need to contact me again and I can close all activity for the previous fiscal year. Uh, so there are a number of tasks that can help you to prepare for the rollover. You can run the outstanding orders reports. Um, this helps identify which purchase orders will be rolled over or will remain attached to the previous fiscal year. Uh, it is important to release or delete pending purchase orders. You should also pay open invoices so that money is expended from the correct fiscal year and apply known credits to paid invoices. You can also ask for me to run your pre-processing report as much as you would like. Um, and this shows the current state of the fund balances to be rolled over. Um, it is also possible to schedule a test rollover in training, um, but the data will not be current. Now's a great time of the year to review the instructions uh, for correcting the uninvoiced purchase orders or unlinked purchase orders. Um, even when the purchase orders have been received, they need to be properly linked to an invoice before the fiscal year rollover. So if they are not linked to the invoices, the purchase orders will roll over to the next fiscal year. This slide lists a number of SQL queries that are helpful to run. <clears throat> On the purchase order line item find tool, you'll see the received polys, not invoiced query. The purchase order find tool has two saved queries. One is purchase orders not canceled or closed, and the other is purchase orders not invoiced. And then there's also one on the invoices find tool that's invoices not paid or closed. Um, so on the day of the rollover, CCS staff will complete the rollover early in the morning before 7 a.m. We also have an option to do it after 9 p.m. instead. Um, when, and this is done when no other staff are using the database, we will send an email out to the acquisitions listserv to let everyone know um, of the upcoming rollover and send an all clear when it's safe to resume working in the acquisitions module. 
uh, CCS will rename your new fiscal year, um, but the library staff will need to add or delete any new funds as needed and allocate the dollar amounts to the funds. So are there any questions about the fiscal year rollout? What day is that exactly? Um, it can be scheduled when you are ready. Okay. I have a question. Yes. If there's a fund that um, has an encumbrance, but it's no longer going to be needed for the next fiscal year, um, how do you move that encumbrance to somewhere else? When you are rolling roll overing the free balance, it can be a bit challenging because uh, Polaris does not allow you to actually delete that fund until another year has gone by that nothing um, has been purchased with that fund. So what we recommend doing is to change the name of the fund um, to something like uh, XXX uh, slash fund and then not using that for the whole fiscal year. Then during the next fiscal year, it will allow you to delete it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Keith uh, added to the chat that he has some appended do not use. Is there any other questions? Okay, um, we can move on to the next, um, Ms. Lee and Rachel, uh, purging or deleting purchase orders and invoices. Lee, can you tell us more about your policy for per purging purchase orders and invoices that you used before joining CCS? I don't think anyone has done that yet. Um, yeah, at Palatine, what we used to do is like the old fiscal year purchase orders or invoices, we actually deleted off of our system. So since moving over to CCS, I asked what the procedure was as far as removing the 2019-2020 uh, invoices that's still in the system. So I know while I've been working here, I don't think anyone has done that, but I have done some research into it um, and tested it out in training. Uh, so Polaris um, will allow us to purge all fiscal year and invoices, I mean, all purchase orders and invoices um, before a specified date. Um, and not by the specific fiscal year. So um, if we'd set it for one specific date, it would cover multiple fiscal years. Um, and But this does not delete the fund uh, and fiscal year records. Um, and they also cannot be deleted manually from the system. Um, so this does allow for the records to be maintained in Polaris. And so if anyone is interested in doing this um, at the time of your rollover, it is possible. I guess my other question is for the other library that's in CCS, what would be your reason for even keeping the old purchase orders and invoices in the staff client? Lay. Um, at ELA, sometimes we might have a specific collection um, for like a special program 
for instance, like the buzz books, and it's helpful to go back and see, okay, how did we allocate the funds? Like, what did we do previously with this special collection that maybe comes around once a year or maybe once every two years? That's one way I know I look back at old POs and, and kind of gauge what funds they came out of. So do you, Brenda, keep like just the previous year information or like, I guess like how far back is all the POs and invoices in the, that you, each library keeps? Like um, has it, anything ever been deleted? That's a good question. <laughs> I know I can go back and see um, like invoices and POs from like 2019. I guess I assume at some point they, they do get deleted out of the system, but I'm not sure where the cutoff is. Okay, um, thank you. In answer to Jamie King's question, I can give you a reason. Um, the reason I'm asking about the purging of invoices or even the POs is because when I do a particular, like um, the way I receive at Palatine, it pulls up, like for example, Harry Potter. When we purchase a new Harry Potter book and when I search for my PO, it pulls up everybody's uh, purchase order back to whatever how many years it's been. But it's like 400 and something POs are out there. So that's that was my reason of asking about purging and deleting purchase orders. Yeah, I think um, maybe, if I could add, um, it's a naming convention that we use the date and then, you know, like if, for your example, Harry Potter, if it was something for like youth fiction new, the purchase order would be the date, um, like 3 16, 22, and then why F-I-C-N for youth fiction new. And then we can just sort it by the name, like with the date. Um, I do do that like, as far as like searching just for our record. But I, like I said, I was just curious as to why we would have all those purchase orders out there. That's all, thank you. Yeah, I think one of the biggest reasons is, you know, a point of reference or it, having it as a record to look back on if we needed it for any reason um, versus um, printing them and keeping uh, paper copies. It's just a way to reference. Well, if I ever needed to like reference back to an in invoice, my business office actually keeps a hard copy because for auditing purposes. Right. Um, for us, um, there's copy kept, but a lot of things get the physical copies get sent to Iron Mountain. So it's not for record keeping. So it's not easy for us to access um, those paper copies. And we were keep, we keep some paper records in technical services, but that's also a space issue. So that would be one reason we'd hang on to them. So there, there is a comment from Helga. She says that um, as a standalone library with uh, Symphony, they deleted them, but hadn't thought of deleting them in the last couple of years. Well, I, I guess that's all what I really wanted to find out was um, what libraries would, you know, why would they wouldn't delete the, or purge purchase orders. But thank you for everyone for your response. Anybody, anything else on this? Thank you, Leigh, for the question. Um, so we'll move on to the next point, which is the capitalization of PDRs on uh, 
quarter standard. So, Rachel? One moment, I need to share my screen. Great, we received a request to um, review the capitalization uh, requirements for PDRs um, because there have been a number of on order records that um, are not capitalized. So um, there is a statement on this in the catalogers wiki. Um, so the catalogers wiki can be accessed from the homepage of um, the CCS website. And if you scroll down just a bit to the bibliographic input standards and click on CCS on order bibliographic record input standards, there is a section um, and this um, states that the title should be in capital letters if possible. So um, there are a number of libraries that actually do not bring in uh, vendor records, but instead will import on order records from OCLC manually, and these are not capitalized already. So this um, allows for those libraries to uh, not have to retype the title. Um, so it really is only um, recommended if you can uh, ask the vendor to automatically do that for you. We don't want to require anyone to do extra work. So when you do see those on order records that um, are not in capital letters, that is completely fine. Are there any questions? Okay, we'll move on. And the next one up is Amazon Promotional Discounts. Sandy? Hi. Um, one thing our department was curious about how other libraries are handling, for instance, when we purchase things from Amazon. We are on Amazon Business now, and we are getting more promotional credits more frequently. And so we're just wondering how um, other libraries are handling that. When I do the drop down, um, for instance, when I'm doing the on order or, or the invoice, and there is a credit next to where the shipping, um, there's processing charges, uh, there's a, a, on that first page, you can, it says credit, but it says it will only credit with another header. And so it doesn't allow me to give the credit there. Um, so then what I do is I just reduce each item in that cart. But just wondering if um, other people handle it differently with the Amazon promotional credits. Just curious. For us, our structure is we submit uh, the orders to our business office and they do um, all of the Amazon orders. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Victoria. Rachel, do you um, get what I'm saying with um, the drop down in the first page where it says there is a um, there is a place where it says credit by the shipping and the processing other services, it'll say other and then credit, but it won't let me use the credit there because it, 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 it'll give me a message saying I have to have another header charge. Does that make sense to you at all where, where I'm saying that? Um, in Polaris? Yes, in the client. Um, can you... You know what? I will send you a screenshot. I'll okay. send you a screenshot of it. Um, I can't do it right now, but I will send you a okay. screenshot and um, maybe you can explain. I, yeah, we were confused why that was the case. So I'll, I'll send you a screenshot. Okay. Th thanks, for, thanks for letting me share. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't understand at first that you were saying that it was in the, the staff client versus on Amazon site. 
So now, yeah. Apologize. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. That, okay. That, yeah. That it was in, in Flaris where, yeah. So when I'm entering, you know, doing the on order record. Got it. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any additional input on that? Okay. Um, next is uh, credit invoice. Lay, you're up again. <laughs> I'm full of questions today. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the reason I'm asking about the credit invoice is, um, like, for example, we get, um, like, after I input the Ingram invoices, and then we discover there's a damaged book, and then Ingram gives us a credit for that amount. Well, I guess I could cancel that. But it, it kind of go back to Sandy's. Okay, forget my first Ingram, but it goes back to what Sandy was saying about credit, like uh, Amazon order and then a promotional, I pay the invoice and then I get a credit because it was a lower price for like a, a video game. Like they originally charge us $60 and then they're like, oh, because you pre-order it, it's actually $50, you know, so that's a $10 credit. So I know Rachel showed uh, me a way to do it where I unpay the invoice and then put the credit in, but that kind of changed the status date of that paid invoice. Be of the original, you know, it changes the date, and I, I guess I, I actually like the fact that I I want the original pay date, but once I unpay it and put the credit in, it changes the date. Is, does anyone else have a different way to do it so that I can put the credit in without changing? Or there's a different method, I guess. That's what I'm asking. Uh, well, uh, Lauren Pinsley at Innovative uh, would recommend adjusting the um, expenditures in the fund record instead of directly adjusting the invoice. She um, recommends that because sometimes using credits can uh, lock the invoice so that you can't do anything else to it after you've applied your credit. Sandy? Um, you know what I what we do is um, we just do we leave you know we leave the regular original price on the old invoice and I just do a um, credit memo through uh, like miscellaneous but on the miscellaneous when I do the miscellaneous I you know I'm able to credit the right fund and then um, the, I can put a note in that miscellaneous credit memo what the credit was for and the date and everything. So that if I ever need to go back, I can look that up. Just do it under um, miscellaneous is how we do it, how we handle it. That way I don't have to unpay it. And like you said, have a different date. I don't wanna change my date either. So I, I hope that um, you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway. I do, thank, thank you. you. Okay, I, I, I do. Thank you. There's a note in chat from Keith. I think it's related to um, Sandy's topic. It says um, that his initial workaround was to add a one cent other charge and adjust the credit for it. Um, he modifies a list item price um, and notes it on the invoice notes. All right, um, any other comments, questions on this topic? Any questions? So what did you, if you have questions, Rachel? One 
one moment, I need to share my screen. So I know most of you have a strong understanding of CCS services and resources. However, it is important to review some of the basics periodically in case any new staff have joined us. So today I'd like to spend some time providing an overview of CCS resources for you as a review of our services. Um, so an important service is our technical support. If you have any questions, you can always contact us via the help desk. Um, the website is help.ccslib.org. You can also email us and it will go directly to the um, help desk by emailing help at ccslib.org. If you have any immediate concerns, you are welcome to give us a call. Feel free to call me anytime about acquisitions topics, and I can have an impromptu meeting with you um, during um, non-work hours. We do have an on-call staff, and you can uh, call the main line, um, which is on the screen, and it will connect you to that on-call staff. The on-call staff is on call. Um, during the weekdays between 5 and 9 p.m. and also on the weekends during regular library um, hours. A CCS newsletter is sent out every Friday. This newsletter includes announcements and links to new documentation and training opportunities. If you are not receiving this newsletter, you can sign up at the bottom of the CCS homepage. Library staff regularly communicate via listservs for acquisitions. This is the ACQ listserv. The system status listserv is also an important one to be subscribed to. This system status listserv will include announcements when the system might be down or um, when a library uh, has to close due to unforeseen circumstances. If you are not receiving these emails, please uh, contact the help desk and we can subscribe you. Um, each library does have a technical services email address that begins with the first three letters, uh, or the I mean the three letters of your library code, and um, looks like the example on the screen for LFK Tech at ccslib.org. That's for Lake Forest. Um, this can be used to contact technical services departments directly. These emails are forwarded to a department email or to individual staff emails. If you need to update the recipients of this email address, please contact the help desk. Um, if you do receive emails from other libraries, please respond to the sender and let them know that you are working on the issue. I do regularly get um, requests for me to look into an issue that has been sent to a library via this um, email address if uh, libraries do not respond. So I know that everyone would really appreciate it if um, you can respond when you receive an email um, through these email addresses. So as you know, our website has been recently redesigned. Uh, you can now access all documentation that you will need from the website. This includes policies, procedures, um, are in the how-to section, um, and meeting information on the calendar. Uh, minutes and links to recordings will be maintained in the calendar portion of the website. Um, web reports is also a very useful tool for customized reports that um, I think could be 
utilized more by the acquisitions departments, but I know that um, there are so many canned reports that are available in the client um, that um, not as many acquisitions departments have thought of using web reports yet for customizing the reports, but since Simply Reports can be pretty glitchy, I wanted to put in a plug for um, web reports because Bob is completely capable of creating any customized acquisitions reports. I know one library um, who has requested a customized invoice report, um, and this can be accessed via web reports and is regularly automatically run. So feel free to contact the help desk um, if you'd like any customized reports uh, created and output to web reports. One of CCS's greatest services is the ample amount of training opportunities that we provide. Every quarter, we provide training on a number of different topics. Um, as you know, there will be the training for acquisitions in LEAP in April. And in June, I will be planning to lead training on importing records. If you have any suggestions for training, please let us know. Um, I also regularly provide one-on-one -on -one training for new staff or um, staff in a whole department. Opportunities uh, for one-on-one -on -one training can include new manager training, um, reviewing the acquisitions workflow, training on specific Polaris functions and reports. Recently, uh, staff at um, a member library retired. So I held a three-part acquisitions boot camp for the staff um, because the supervisors needed a review before they hired the new acquisitions staff. So this is um, also an opportunity that other libraries could um, pursue. Um, and feel free to contact me anytime um, if you'd like any customized training sections, even if it's um, an immediate need. Um, so I would also like to end by putting in a plug for the technical and advisory groups. Um, they really have been a great way uh, for library staff to gain leadership experience and participate in the shared governance of CCS and network with other library staff. Um, so please do uh, consider nominating yourself for the uh, officer positions. Um, as Victoria mentioned, it is pretty easy with the two meetings a year for um, acquisitions. Uh, and um, the year of being the chair elect is much easier than the year in which you're a chair. So it really is not much work um, unless the chair has to be absent um, until the year after that. Um, so I just wanted to put in another plug to remind you to consider nominating yourself. Um, as you've seen today, if you're new to the group, the acquisitions group regularly discusses policies and procedures, and I can also demonstrate any processes by request to add training into these meetings. Um, and so they really are great opportunities for everyone to get together and um, solve problems and network. Are there any other questions? Um, Rachel, in regard to that web report, um, if I needed, you said to send it to the CCS help desk, like yes. a specific web report that I want. Okay. Yes. Um, since uh, Simply Reports is really glitchy and produces wrong amounts, um, anything that you would normally want to produce in Simply Reports um, that might produce those errors can definitely be created in Web Reports. And anything else that um, even Simply Reports would normally uh, not be capable of can be customized and um, added to web reports to be automatically run as much as you like. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Rachel, again for the, oh, 
I muted? Oh, no. Okay. And thank you for the plug for uh, the officers. It's, it's a really good opportunity. So um, please let us know if you'd like to nominate yourself. Okay, the next um, is announcements. Does anybody have any announcements about their library or anything else? Um, hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Nora Masney. I'm the new head of tech at Prospect Types. Um, so just, hi everyone. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Thank you. Hello there. I'm also new. I'm at Evanston Public Library. I just started this week in acquisitions. Wonderful. Thank you. Anybody else who is um, new since our last meeting in September would like to introduce themselves? All right. Um, there's no more announcements. Um, I would like to get um, a motion to adjourn. I motion. Thank you, Leigh. And a second, please. I second. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you uh, next in September. No. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the meeting. Have a nice one. Rachel, 